video of the whole book of Acts. Some of you are able to whistle along with it. Some of you recognize that's actually skillet. Uh, I think we had to rock it up, uh, crank it on up every, every week. Well, good morning, everybody. Happy, or shall we say, Merry Chiefsmas. Anybody in favor? Joy, I know Joyce is. She's all, she's all about it. Okay, any 49ers? I, I want to honor. Yours. We need to pray. What's your name? Sorry. It should be fun. It should be fun to see what, uh, what's about to transpire this afternoon. Uh, looking forward to that. Uh, hopefully after a, a, a good nap this afternoon, I, I ask for your grace this morning, uh, which I, I know you will graciously give. Uh, uh, yesterday was a long day. Um, uh, this week, uh, I said I wouldn't cry, so I'm not going to. Uh, this week, we, uh, my wife received communication from a dear college friend. Uh, her and her husband became very close friends of ours. My wife actually introduced her high school, uh, a gentleman from her high school, to her college roommate. Uh, they got married, uh, grew up, uh, <laughs> got married, moved up to Minneapolis, and uh, raised their family there. We had communication earlier this week that our the husband, dear friend, had a one-person uh, snowmobile accident and uh, killed him f- age 50. So, of course... Uh, we went, uh, the opportunity was to go, and so we uh, went on up to Minneapolis yesterday and back. That's long enough in a drive, let alone uh, just the emotions that go along with uh, the loss of a dear friend. Uh, things will be different. Things will be uh, certainly different. So we appreciate, I appreciate your prayers. Uh, pray for me as I uh, try to bring God's word this morning. Uh, if you're new with us, a special welcome to you here at Timberline Evangelical Free Church. Uh, we uh, hold want to hold up, hold high, hold out the Word of God. Uh, we typically here uh, preach through verse by verse, passage by passage, through a book of the Bible. Most of the time we do that. Sometimes we will do a particular topic. Uh, but the majority of time you'll find is we're working through a book of, of the Bible so that we can become better scholars, better students, and not just become hearers of the Word, but actually become doers of that because we understand why that book is there, why that letter is there so that we might understand it and we might pass it along uh, and to you and you may pass it along to others that they too may understand. So uh, we call it expository preaching. We love hosting a, a preacher's conference every fall here to, pre- to teach preachers how to preach. Uh, not that we've got it all the corner on the market by any means, uh, but uh, it's really good for us to continue to hone in on this skill. Now with that background, let's dive in. I want you to think about your life just for a moment as we, uh, as we get into Acts chapter 15. And I want you to ask yourself this question. Have you ever gotten into a debate with somebody else? Now if you're a high schooler, you might be in a high school debate. You might be on a debate team. That's cool. It gives you some exercise, some experience in, in debating different subjects, different issues. Now I want you to ask yourself this. Have you ever gotten into a debate centered around the truth of God's word? Have you ever gotten into a debate with a person or a group of people arguing the truth of the scriptures? I think, as I, as I think about that this morning, I, I thought, and I, as I thought about to prepare for this sermon this morning, I thought of probably one of the best debates that, uh, that church history has seen is revolved around a gentleman by the name of Martin Luther. You might be familiar certainly with, with that name if you follow church history at all. In fact, this great debate of church history began, it's a claim to have begun October 31st of 1517, which many mark as the beginning of what's called the Protestant Reformation, or you might simplify it and say a protest to reform. Now, there's a picture of this gentleman by the name of Martin Luther we're going to throw up on the screen there. And Martin Luther, I'm just going to give you a picture, a rendition of him. A little bit about this gentleman and the debate that that ensued around him. Martin Luther, the gentleman on the screen, was a friar. Now, a friar is not a guy who likes to fry up food in the kitchen. A friar was a religious teacher in the Roman Catholic Church in that time. 
And uh, one of the, probably the most uh, acclaimed works that Martin Luther is known for is his 95 Theses. 95, basically simplified 95 different things that he wanted to encourage or challenge the Roman Catholic Church to consider or to consider changing that they may or may not be doing biblically accurate. I mean, he got into teaching in the Roman Catholic Church because he was actually afraid of hell. That's actually his story. He was afraid of hell, so he thought, well, I'm going to do the good work of becoming a teacher in the Roman Catholic Church so that God will be pleased with me. Kind of a works-based belief, wouldn't you say? Right? And so that's the reason that motivated him to get into the Catholic Church and to become a teacher. But God had other plans to, to introduce him to the truth of the gospel message. Martin Luther wrote this 95 Theses, and some of the things that he addressed were uh, the authority of the Pope. Where does that start and stop? Uh, the indulgences that were going on in the time. Uh, penances, which penances are basically self-punishment for wrongdoing. Now, Martin Luther wrote up these 95 theses, 95 things. And what was customary in that day was that if you were a teacher in the, in, the, in, the, in the Roman Catholic Church, you could write something up and you would go and post it on the castle churches, uh, you know, on the, on the door frame of the castle church there in Wittenberg, Germany. And that's exactly what Martin Luther did. So that wasn't out of character of the culture of that day. He did what was, what was culturally acceptable. But what was interesting is the response he got, not just from the religious leaders, but also throughout the population that were saying, man, he's right, there's something about this that, that needs to change. And so from 1517 all the way to uh, the year of 1521, almost 500 years ago, next year will be 500 years, there was a climax that happened in 1521, which is called the Diet of Worms, spelled worms, Diet of Worms. Luther was to appear in front of what was called the Imperial Diet, an emperor and a number of great lords in Germany, uh, and they were basically a council made up along with some of his fellow teachers, and, and he was to stand uh, for what, it, he, he had to defend his faith and his teaching before this council. Now I like what, uh, what Justo Gonzalez, how he writes about it. Let me just give you a little excerpt about what transpired there on that special day in 1521. It says here, the man, the man in charge of the process showed him a number of books, showed Luther a number of books, and asked him if he had indeed written them. After examining them, Luther responded that such was the case and that he had also written other books besides. Then he asked if he, shall, if he still held to what he had declared in those publications or wished to recant anything. This was a difficult moment for Luther not so much because he feared imperial power, but rather because he feared God. To dare to oppose the entire church and the emperor whose authority had been ordained by God was a dreadful act. Once again, the friar, Luther, trembled before the divine majesty and asked for a day's time in which to consider his answer. He knew, depending on how he answered, potentially would cause him his death by his faith in Christ. By the next day, it was widely known that Luther was to appear before the Diet. Then the hall was filled. The emperor's presence at Worms with a corpse of Spanish soldiers who, who showed little respect for Germans had irritated the population as well as many German princes. Once again, Luther was asked to recant. In the midst of a great hush, the friar answered that much of what he had written was basic Christian doctrine held by both he and his opponents, and that therefore no one would expect him to repudiate such teaching. At some other points, he continued his works dealt with the tyranny and injustice the German people suffered. This too, he said, he could not recant, for which was not the purpose of the Diet anyway, and in any, in any case, to withdraw such words would result in even greater injustice for the German populace. Third in his works, there were, there were attacks against certain individuals and points of doctrine that were at issue between he and his opponents. Perhaps, he confessed, some of these things have been said too harshly, but their truth he could not deny unless someone could convince him that he was in error. So the man in charge of the hearing says, do you recant or do you not? To this, Luther responded in German, therefore setting aside the Latin of tradition, the, traditional theological debate Luther responded like this. He says, 
My conscience is a prisoner of God's word. I cannot and I will not recant, for to disobey one's conscience is neither just nor safe. God help me, amen. Luther stood for what God's word stated, and he could not or would not recant because his conscience would not allow him. His conscience had been changed by the word of God. Now, one of the greatest things that Martin Luther uh, was known for saying was this, and, it's, and it really uh, focuses our text this morning, focuses a lot about this today, and so does Scripture, and it's this. Salvation is by God's grace alone, by faith alone, in Christ alone. Let me say it again. Salvation is by God's grace alone, by faith alone, in Christ alone. It's the very heart of the gospel of Jesus Christ, my friends. It's the very heart of Luther's teaching, and it's the very heart of our passage today. It's the heart of the debate we actually see in Acts chapter 15. And it's the question here before us this morning, is it true that salvation is by God's grace alone, by faith alone, in Christ alone, or... As Christ followers, do we still have to uphold the, the law of Moses? That's the question that we're going to wrestle with here a little bit today. So I invite you to turn to Acts chapter 15 in your Bibles or turn in your, in your Bible apps and we invite you to, to follow along. As you're finding your way, I just want to give you kind of a, a track of where we're at. You'll see the map on the, on the screen uh, we started a few weeks ago. We started uh, going by through the, the Paul's journey with Barnabas to the island of Cyprus, all the way up to Antioch of Presidian, and, and then over. And now what we saw last week, if you follow the red line back over here to where it says Syria, you'll see the red arrow comes to Antioch. That is where we left off last week in Acts chapter 14. That's actually where we pick up this morning. The ch Paul and Barnabas are gathered together with the church in Antioch after they sailed there. And it says in Acts 14, 27, as we left off last week, they declared to all what God had done to the Gentiles by faith. Now with that... Look at verse, chapter 15, verse 1, as we open it up this morning. It says this, But some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, Unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Now, as we can imagine, those words said in the presence of the apostle Paul and Barnabas created no small debate. According to verse 1, the debate really started off here in Antioch all around salvation. Can a person be saved by God's grace alone, by faith alone, in Christ alone? Or does a person have to be circumcised, a male have to be circumcised according to the custom of Moses, the law of Moses? Now, if you can imagine just for a minute, Paul and Barnabas had been on an amazing mission trip. If you remember their time in the Isle of Cyprus, they traveled 90 miles across that island, and for what we understand, there was really, the governor was the only one that they actually saw that, that Luke records in Acts that came to faith. He and his family, we understand from history, came to faith, and then they headed off across to the mainland, and then we see time and time again, many, many Gentiles came to faith in Jesus. In fact, Acts 13, 48 says, when the Gentiles heard the gospel, they began rejoicing and worshiping, glorifying the word of the Lord, and as many as were appointed to eternal life, believed. God was saving the Gentiles, my friends, without the works of the law being required. But now we come today to Acts 15, verses 1 and 2, and this question rises up, what does God require of the Gentiles? To be saved. Is it by grace alone? By faith alone in Christ alone? Or do the Gentiles have to convert back to Judaism and obey the works of the law of Moses as well? Do they have to go and be circumcised? No wonder there was an incredible debate 
if these words were uttered in front of the apostle Paul and Barnabas, especially after all they had seen with the Gentiles coming to faith that God had done, the Holy Spirit coming upon them, and, and, and now somebody's saying these feuding words to Paul and Barnabas, that works were required to be saved. So there was a great debate. I love how he says it in verse two. He says, no small dissension and debate. We can only imagine what that must have looked like. But they decided, as a result of that argument, that debate in Antioch, that they would send a few down to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders about this question. As we get to verse four, it says that they were welcomed by the church and all these apostles and elders as well. And what Paul and Barnabas did as they had just done in Antioch, they celebrated, they shared the good news of God coming upon, the salvation of God coming upon the Gentiles where they had gone. But as we see in verse five, it says in verse five that some believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees agreed with those back in Antioch. Did you catch that? It says in verse five, some believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees. So there were those that had come to faith in Jesus, but they were also promoting that they believed in Jesus, but they were wanting to add works. They wanted to hold on to their old traditions yet at this point. And they were proclaiming, not only do you need to be circumcised, but you actually have to keep the law of Moses, verse five says. So what is necessary? They're saying it's necessary to be circumcised to keep the law. But my friends, what is it? What is necessary to be saved according to the scriptures? To add the law of Moses to the gospel, is that what's required? To the apostle Paul and Martin Luther some 1,500 years later, adding the work of, uh, works to salvation in order to be saved, dilutes the power of God's word, his saving power of what Jesus Christ did on the cross. It's Jesus's work, his finished work on the cross. We just celebrated that with the Lord's Supper. It is Jesus's finished work on the cross. It is his finished work, it's his resurrection that gives us hope in eternal life. And so to say that it requires belief in Jesus plus works in order to be saved, goes directly, those are feuding words for Paul. Those are feuding words for Martin Luther. Now I love what Luke does when he he outlines the argument that happens here in verses six through 21 this morning. What he begins each one of these sections in this passage, he says, look at all these witnesses. So in verses six through 11, Uh, Luke takes us to Peter. It says in in verse seven, it says, uh, and after there had been much debate, Peter stood up. And then if you look down at verse 12, we see Luke making sure we know that Barnabas and Paul stood up and spoke. And then we see in verse 13 where the finishing speech comes from James. So Luke is making clear for his friend Theophilus who he wrote the book of Acts to. He says, look, It's not just Barnabas and Paul talking about it. It's also Peter talking about it. It's also James who's talking about it. They were all witnesses, but I I love, love, love what Luke does here. He says, these people stood up to give witness, but what did they witness? And if you're an underliner in your Bible or a highlighter in your app, I invite you to underline and highlight very quickly as I cover what they promote. You see, what they talk about is not about themselves, but what they talk about is what God chose to do. We need to understand that, my friends. Still to this day, it is God who does the work. It is God who saves us. Look at verse seven for a moment. You might want to underline it. It says in verse seven, God made a choice. Brothers, you know in early days, God made a choice among you. Verse eight, it says, God knows the heart. Verse eight says, God bore witness to them. Verse eight, God gave them, meaning the Gentiles, the Holy Spirit. Verse nine, God made no distinction between the Jews and the Gentiles. Verse nine, God cleansed their hearts by faith. And then Paul and Barnabas stand up and they talk about the signs and miracles that God, verse 12, had done. 
And then verse 14, James says, God first visited the Gentiles. And then God spoke by the prophets. And he even quotes from Amos in verses 16 through 18. It was God who spoke by all the prophets, making it known hundreds and hundreds of years before this even transpired. Made it very clear through the prophets that God's plan was to redeem the Gentiles. So what we can see is Luke is making clear for us that Peter, Barnabas, Paul, and James were giving testimony about all of God's work in salvation. And what they testify is that it is by God's grace, by faith alone, in Christ alone. So if God has gone from city to city with Paul and Barnabas to save Gentiles, Peter, Peter, as he did that, Peter also professes that what God had done in verse 7 when he proclaimed the gospel to Cornelius, and we know that Cornelius came to faith. Paul and Barnabas declare that it was God who changed their hearts by faith and displayed the power of the Holy Spirit amongst some amongst the Gentiles. And if God proclaimed all of this, and he proclaimed it by the prophets of the Old Testament, that he would come to the Gentiles himself, why in the world, verse 10, were, they, were the Pharisees wanting to do something that no one could bear? Look at verse 10. It says, why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear. I love what Kent Hughes says in his commentary. He says, God had given them the law as a schoolmaster to lead them to Christ by demonstrating at every turn they were sinners in need of God's mercy. So, If God has already saved many Gentiles without the obedience to the law, why is it that they were trying to make the law be part of the requirement for salvation? I mean, if the Old Testament promises have all been fulfilled in Jesus Christ alone, by grace alone, by faith alone, in Christ, what more is required? And my friends, the answer still to this day and always will be nothing. Nothing. Salvation is by God's grace alone, by faith alone, in Christ alone. Paul said that in Ephesians 2. Many of us are familiar with that passage, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. It's not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not by works, so that no man can boast. Our salvation is by God's grace through faith, not by the works of the law, so that none of us can boast. What we can boast instead about is the cross of Jesus Christ. That is the work that we rely on. Amen? Amen. I love how James uh, (laughs) concludes this debate, or I wish he concluded the debate here in verse 19. Look with me, if you will. It says, therefore, so everything, all this debate, all this Peter, Barnabas, all of them talking and speaking and, and debating what the Pharisees were trying to instill, here's what James speaks. And I think James is the pastor of the church in Jerusalem at this time, as well as we can tell. He speaks, it looks like, on behalf of the council and himself. It says, therefore, my judgment is that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God. Now, I want you to see something in your passage. Here's here's what I wished when I was in my study this week and I got to verse 19 and I thought, great statement, James, way to rock it, buddy. And then I realized, that's a comma after God, not a period. And I realized I was wishing he would have just stopped right there and that's all that was recorded, that's all that was needed. But then he goes on and Luke records verses 20 and 21 for us, for a reason, and this was the this where we're going to spend the rest of our message in this morning, because we got to get twenty and twenty one very clear. It says this. Here's a but. A but should write to them. So it's them writing to the church around the region. But should write to them to abstain from the things polluted by idols, 
from sexual immorality and from what has been strangled and from blood. For from ancient generations, Moses has had in every city those who proclaim him, for he has read every Sabbath in the synagogue. Now, does that shock, does 21 and 20 and 21 shock you as much as it shocks me? I mean, I really wish James would have stopped at the end of verse 19. I mean, all the witnesses confess that it's God's work in saving. It's by God's grace. It's by God. It's by faith in him. It's by Christ alone. I mean, we got it, right? It seems like that's what James said by, by verse 19. So, so now, I mean, now, now that's clear, and we know that believing Gentiles, they're by faith, by God's grace alone. Why in the world do they go on and say in 20 and 21 these four things? So therefore, abstain from idol worship, abstain from sexual immorality, abstain from food that's improperly prepared, and avoid contact with blood. My friends, do those all four of those sound vaguely like the law? It, the answer is yes, because they are. But I thought that we had just, James had just said, it's by faith, it's, it's done. End of story. It's by God's grace, by faith alone, in Christ alone, so why in the world? Why would we want them to try to hold this up, these four things? Why are they telling them to hold those four things up? I don't get it. And as I wrestled with 20 and 21, in context, I think the answer is this. It's worth writing down. Love. Love. You're going, all right, pastor, you've gone off the deep end, right? It's love. It's loving God and it's loving others. It's learning to love Gentiles, learning to love Jews, Jews learning to love Gentiles. I think it's all part of this, this, uh, this teaching that Paul speaks a lot about in other passages of his letters. We'll talk a little bit about this morning as well, but I think it all is boiled, uh, reaches right up underneath the umbrella of the ministry of reconciliation that, that we are a part of. Once we're reconciled in Christ, to Christ and to others, therefore we must be reconciled to one another. And our ministry of reconciliation is rooted in God's love. Let me explain that for a moment. 2 Corinthians 5.14 says this, for the love of Christ controls us. 2 Corinthians 5.18, all of this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. So we are reconciled to Christ and we are to be reconciled to one another. So then why should the Gentiles abstain from these things? not because they need to do them in order to be saved. Then why? I think the answer is found in verse 21. For from ancient generations, Moses has had in every city those who proclaim him, for he's read every Sabbath in the synagogue. Do you get it? What I believe James and the council is saying is that as, as, as we interact or as they would interact with the Gentiles, with the Jews, and the Jews with the Gentiles, they needed to love one another well, respecting their heritage, respecting what they knew at that point. And what they knew was that their minds were molded to the law of Moses. Their minds had been shaped by the law that they understand. So in other words, if, if, if they were gonna have a, a table fellowship together as part of one body, as part of one body in Christ, it was not right for a Gentile to come and, and bring some sloppy piece of beef, although we might like it today, it was dishonoring to their brothers and sisters of the Jewish congregation. That would create a stumbling block to their fellowship. So if Jews and Gentiles were supposed to live together in a reconciled way, they needed to learn how to belong to one another in Christ. The Gentiles would need to live and understand how to love others, both those that were in the church and also to live differently amongst those who they were trying to reach of the Jewish populace. Starts to make sense, doesn't it? The Gentiles need to love those who were raised differently than them by choosing to pull back. 
on even some of the freedoms that they were given in Christ. They were called to pull back. Now I want to be really, really clear here. We must never, ever, ever surrender the truth of the gospel message for the sake of belonging. We should never surrender the truth of the gospel for the sake of belonging. But as Christ followers, we may choose to surrender some of our freedoms that are graciously given to us in Christ in order to live and to belong to one another in the body of Christ for the sake of gospel unity. Let me try to illustrate this for a moment. Uh, a number of years ago, probably 17, 18 years ago, I went on a vision trip to the country of Brazil. And I uh, went down with a friend of mine to, uh, to check out this country. Uh, we were coming alongside this larger evangelical free church in the southern part of Brazil. And while we were down there, uh, the pastor and one of the local North American missionaries that were stationed there uh, took a couple of us around uh, from house to house and we would meet different people from the church. We were coming alongside of them to hopefully help to plant another evangelical free church in another portion of southern Brazil. And so they took us around the entire 12 days or whatever it was, 14 days, they took us around house to house to house. That's what we did. And they were intentionally uh, having us connect with both the believers in the church and non-believers that the church was trying to reach. And so we went house to house. And if you've ever been to Brazil, if you've ever been in people's homes, they know how to cook. I thought I would lose weight on that vision trip. I think I gained something like 10 pounds. It's one of the places where I came to love and fall in love with smoked meat. I'm telling you, that's just a heavenly aroma, let alone the taste, right? I look forward to the men sing February 29, by the way. But When we went house to house to house, we would eat and we would share the good news of Jesus. We'd encourage the believers uh, and we would share the good news with those who didn't believe yet, inviting them into a relationship. One of the houses we stayed at or came to uh, one uh, late afternoon, this non-believing gentleman knew how to smoke meat. It was probably one of the best a few pieces of meat I had ever had in my entire life. And when we got all done, it was culturally uh, normal for them to pass around a little toothpick holder uh, because a good meal would require maybe a toothpick. And so everybody would take a toothpick, pass it, you know, pass the jar around, and you take your toothpick and truth form. uh, This farmer kid, this kid grew up on the farm in Northeast Iowa, I, uh, I, you know, did my thing after a great, you know, meal. And being probably not so culturally accurate, Uh, maybe even in our culture today, I'd let the toothpick hang out of my mouth when I was done. Now, I did that (laughs) until the local missionary looked over with an incredible fear. And he leans over and he says, right now you are being the most crass North Americans I have ever seen on the planet. Get those toothpicks out of your mouth. I had no idea that that was absolutely a form of disrespect to the people who who were hosting us for that meal. And I will never, (laughs) ever forget it the rest of my life. Unintentionally, we were being offensive. Now, I think if James would have written verse 20 to me, It would have said something like this, in order to have table fellowship with others, when you have finished a meal with someone, abstain from letting your stupid toothpick hang out of your mouth, pastor. Because this was love. I needed to know their culture. I needed to know their beliefs. I needed to respect humbly what I could do freely back here in Iowa, I was not to do in the country of Brazil. Paul writes a little bit about this. I want you to see that this is not the only place we see how we are to get along one with another. Paul speaks extensively about this in a few other passages. Let me cover those quickly for you. You might want to write them down. 1 Corinthians 9, 19 through 23. Paul says, For though I am free from all, I've made myself a servant to all, that I might win more of them. To the Jews I become as a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law I became as one under the law, though not being myself under the law, 
that I might win those under the law. Now to those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. To the weak, that I might win the weak. I've become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel, that I might share with them in its blessings. Did you hear Paul's heart there? I become a servant I want to become like them so that they might share in the good news of Jesus Christ and the eternal blessings that come by grace alone, by faith alone, in Christ alone. That's Paul's heart. My friends, that ought to be our heart as well. So I promote to you this morning as Christians, as Christ followers, we must choose deference over preference. If you have your Bibles with you, I invite you to turn briefly over to Romans 14. I want you to see this even again here. The church in Rome had issues. They were mixed with Jews and Gentiles in the church. But when it came to enjoying family, a fellowship meal, there were problems in the church. And Paul writes about it in Romans 14. Verses one through six, he says this, as for the one who's weak in faith, welcome him, but don't quarrel over opinions. One person believes he may not eat anything while the weak person eats only vegetables. Let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains and let not the one who abstains pass judgment. Notice how many times Paul will say pass judgment. In this passage, he says, let, let the one who abstains pass judgment let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats, for God has welcomed him. Who are, you not, who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? If it, be, it is before his own master that he stands and fall or falls, and he will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make him stand. One person esteems one day as better than another, while another esteems all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. The one who observes the day observes it in honor of the Lord. The one who eats, eats in honor of the Lord, since he gives thanks to, the God, to God, while the one who abstains, abstains in honor of the Lord and gives thanks to God. Look down now at verse 10 of Romans 14. Why do you pass judgment on your brother? Or you, why do you despise your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. That might be worthy of underlining. We will all stand before the judgment seat of God. Look down to verse 13. Therefore, let us not pass judgment on one another no, any longer, but rather decide never to be a stumbling block or a hindrance in the way of a brother. Verse 19 to 20, so then let us pursue what makes for peace and mutual upbuilding. Do not, for the sake of food, destroy the work of God. Everything is indeed clean, but it is wrong for anyone to make another stumble by what he eats. Now, I want to be really clear here what, uh, of what Paul is saying. Paul is not talking about believers trying to discern if another person is a true believer in Jesus or not. That's not what he's talking about here. Jesus talks about that in Matthew chapter 7 of how God's people are to discern if another person is truly a believer based on the fruit of their lives. That's not what Paul's talking about here. Here we see in Romans 14, Paul is saying, no matter if you have freedom to eat meat or not, no matter what your freedoms are in Christ, no matter if you have freedoms to celebrate a certain day as special or not, we need to learn to love our brothers and sisters and do not pass judgment on them. On, on them. And do not let your freedoms in Christ be a stumbling block to another. Therefore, when we go back to Acts chapter 15, verse 20, it would be best if the Gentile believer chooses to abstain from these four things. Why? As a way of love. And to pursue reconciliation and love and unity and belonging one with another not letting a stumbling block of one of our freedoms stand in the way. Or you might just simply say, when in Brazil, get the toothpick out of your mouth. Don't let it stand in the way. 
Don't be offensive to those you are either trying to fellowship with or trying to reach with the gospel. And that's the message that the council chooses to send out from there to the churches, and we see that through the rest of, uh, all the way to verse 35. Now, in our passage this morning, there are a number of applications, I believe, in our text today. Applications and implications, let me just cover five of them that were pretty obvious. I'm sure we've probably all seen them as we've worked through the passage today right out of the text. First of all, it is okay for the church once in a while to consider together how we are to live in an understanding way in this ever-changing culture. Have you noticed the culture around us is changing, my friends? We need to consider as a body of Christ how we ought to live in this ever-changing culture, not just to encourage and love one another well, but also to reach those that may have other differences so that we can reach them for Christ. Number two, it is God who saves. It is God who saves, both Jew and and Gentile. We see that throughout the passage. It is God who has chosen to do this. It is God who saves. It is God who displays his powerful work. It is God who sends his Holy Spirit. Third, the gospel is by grace alone, by faith alone, in Christ alone. Never, ever settle for less than the gospel in an attempt to belong or to be contemporary in this world. Fourth, Christians are to live by God's word and not force others to live by someone else's conscience or external convictions. Remember what Martin Luther said, my conscience is a prisoner of God's word. Let our consciences be of God's word. Let us model that as we go about our lives. Remember what Martin Luther said? He says, I cannot and I will not recant for to, display, to, 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 to disobey one's conscience is neither wise nor safe. And then lastly, we need to exercise deference over preference. Don't let our freedoms in Christ become a stumbling block for others. This morning as we do at the end of our services here at Timberline. We want to respond. I just invite you right where you're seated this morning to respond. Whatever the Spirit of God's been speaking to you this morning, maybe it is that, that you aren't in faith in Jesus Christ and, and he is drawing you to, your, to himself this morning. He invites you by his grace to believe by faith in the finished work of Christ, to no longer try to earn your way into a right standing before God. Because my friends, the Bible is very clear. There is no way that sinful man, and all of us are sinful, there is no way that sinful man can ever earn their right before God. It is purely by God's grace alone, by faith alone, in belief in Christ alone. Maybe that's you this morning. I invite you. Have a conversation with God as he calls you to be one of his children this morning. Another, th you know, It may be one of these other application points. It might be something else that, that God spoke to you that you've been wrestling with as you came in here this morning. I just invite you, spend a moment in prayer today listening to the Lord and obeying what his spirit is convicting you of this morning. We're gonna play some music quietly in the background. We're gonna pass the offering as well at this time. We invite you to respond as well by the sacrifice of your gifts and talents uh, back to the Lord in your offering today. Let me pray for that and then we'll have our benediction after the offertory. Father, Lord, I pray that you would speak now, Lord, as we reflect on this. Lord, thank you for the good news, the salvation message that is found in Jesus Christ by faith alone. Lord, I pray that you would speak to each of us today. What is it that we need to repent of? What is it that we need to get right before you? What is it, Lord, maybe we've been letting our freedoms stand in the way of actually doing ministry like you were asking us to with a couple or an individual or someone else in our lives. Lord, maybe you're convicting us of that. Whatever it is, Lord, I pray that you would speak to us now. And Lord, we pray as we respond by giving back um, out of the blessings you have given us,
We pray that you would bless this offertory for your continued movement of your kingdom. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite the ushers to come forward.